start a recording. All right, so welcome everybody for being here today. Again, this is the second tutoring session. We've got uh, some great PowerPoints lined up for you uh, from some second medical students at Drexel and uh, VCOM uh, institutions here. So today we're gonna be reviewing skeletal anatomy, histology of cartilage and bone and embryology. And uh, please go ahead and uh, mute any of your um, microphones if they are not already done so. Um, so thanks for being here. Really excited to have you. Uh, just a quick update. We have now more than 400 students registered for the inaugural anatomy across the United States. So this is a really great big thing that you guys are a part of and really glad to have you all here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Frank to introduce our uh, first speaker. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Bill Frank at uh, Drexel University College of Medicine, and I will be your humble narrator for the evening. And uh, again, I want to remind you that we have three uh, presenters this evening. Uh, each will have up to 30 minutes to present material and then a, at least a 10 minute uh, question and answer. Um, if you have questions along the way, you can put them in the uh, chat box and we'll try to answer those that are answerable uh, remotely, and then we can save the rest of them for the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Um, so again, this session will last two hours. So uh, we will be ending hopefully right at 8 p.m. And I think we did a good job last time. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first presenter. He is uh, Zachary Zook. Uh, and he is going to be presenting on the anatomy of the skeletal system. So Zach is from Lancaster, Pennsylvania and graduated from Pennsylvania College of Health Sciences with his Bachelor of Science in Nursing. He is currently a second year student at Drexel University College of Medicine in Pennsylvania. He is interested in orthopedic surgery and anesthesiology. If not on campus studying, which I can attest uh, he is a lot, um, which is a good thing, but if he's not, you can usually find him at the local pickleball court, in a rock climbing gym, or playing some beach volleyball. So without further ado, I will give it to Zach. And uh, if you can get your presentation shared with everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Frank. Um, can everybody see my presentation before I get started? Okay, perfect. So we are good to go. So hi, everyone. Thank you again, Dr. Frank, for the introduction. I am I'm a second year medical student at Drexel, like Dr. Frank said. And I get to present on the skeleton today, which is kind of fun. I love orthopedic surgery, which is um, basically like a doctor of bones and muscles. So this is my favorite part of the body. So very excited. Um, I will say the skeleton is a lot of kind of like rote memorization. So it's a lot of just being able to look at things and knowing what they are. Um, I'll give you some tips and tricks that I use sometimes or when I was first learning some of the skeleton. Um, you can absolutely use them if you want. You are more than welcome to just disregard um, if they if you don't find them helpful. So everyone memorizes a little differently. I'm kind of a conceptual person. So I always had, um, yeah, just little memory quips to help me with things. Um, it's not letting me go. Let me see here. Sorry, it's not allowing me to advance my slide. There we go, perfect. So um, the goal for today is, these are the lecture objectives. I'll just read through them quickly. So describe the gross anatomy and characterizations of bone. So what does bone look like? And then include descriptive terms for common bony landmarks. So, you know, where do muscles attach on bone? What are some of the different things that we'll see when we're looking at a bone? Um, just that kind of things. Identify the bones of the axial and appendicular skeleton. So the skeleton is broken down into kind of two pieces, the axial and appendicular, and we'll go through um, the different bones that are a part of the which skeleton part. Uh, we'll define cartilage, how it, differ in, how it differs from bone anatomically, and identify primary examples of cartilage in the human body. So we'll do that. And then define and classify different types of joints. So there's different ways that bones are um, kind of knitted together, and we'll talk about those towards the end of the presentation. 
So we can jump right into it. So bone is obviously it's a hard, dense, connective tissue. Most of you have a general idea of what bone is. Um, it's made up of osteocytes. And you guys will dive into this a little later about, you know, what exactly is bone all made up of. But bone functions in the body. Um, it helps support the body, right? So kind of without this hard, rigid material, there would be a, a bit of a glob, right? Kind of gives us um, gives us some structure, gives us a shape. Um and then it also helps facilitate movement, right? So muscles pull against bone and then the way bones interact help to facilitate our movement. So kind of all of movement is actually started with bones, which is kind of cool. Um, it also protects internal body organs. So if you think about your skull protects your brain, right? It's like a hard outer covering. And then also your ribs um, help protect some of the things inside of your um, like rib cage. So your heart, your lungs are all protected by bone. Bone can also function um, to produce blood cells, uh, specifically red blood cells, which is really cool. Um, and then it additionally stores and releases minerals. So there's a lot of calcium and phosphate in bone and um, different like body conditions. You'll need more calcium or less calcium. And so bone kind of functions as a reservoir for different um, minerals, which is, yeah, I thought was pretty neat. So how do we describe bones? So there's a couple of different types of bones, right? So the first one that we wanna talk about is long bones. So this is what you think of when you think of kind of like the bones in your legs. So, um, you know, you have your long femur and that's a long bone. And then you also have what's called short bones. So short bones are some of the bones in your wrist and some of the bones in your feet, and they are more square. They're not perfectly square, but generally speaking, a long bone has kind of like an elongated, it's more of like a rectangle or like a really long rectangle shape where a short bone is a little bit more square or cuboidal shape. We also have flat bones. So there's um, a flat bone, right um, in your sternum and it's just kind of a long flat bone it doesn't really have two ends long bones usually have two different ends um, and this flat bone is just kind of flat and one directional more and then there's irregular bones so like your vertebrae there's no really discernible shape so we just call them irregular bones because we didn't really know how else to classify them and then the last type of bones that we have are called sesamoid bones and these bones actually live inside of ligaments and they help reduce um, kind of like ligament wear and tear over other bones, right? So you have um, the biggest sesamoid bone that we have is in the knee, and it is kind of like right inside of a ligament that runs right over the knee. So normally that ligament would be subjected to a lot of wear and tear, um, but because the patella bone is there, it kind of takes away a lot of the stress of that ligament. So that's the point of sesamoid bones. And um, really the biggest one to know is, is the patella. So now we can talk about some bony landmarks, right? So when, when looking at a bone, how are we going to discern one bone from another? And some of the things that you want to start looking for is a tuberosity on our bone, right? So especially in like the humerus, like you can see on this slide, there's a tuberosity and essentially it's like kind of like a long bump in the middle of the bone and a tuberosity oftentimes is where a muscle will attach, right? So it's sort of a ridge or a bump, um, on the bone, that way a muscle can attach and it's it's not kind of like sliding around, but it has a place to insert onto the bone. Um, there's also sulci, which is kind of the opposite of a tuberosity. It's like an indentation in the bone. And this is often where different ligaments will run or there will be nerves or blood vessels that will run through there. So it's kind of like an indentation, um, a long indentation in a bone. We also then have foramen. So there's um, a couple of foramen in our skull and those are just kind of big holes, right? So you can think about your eye socket or where your spinal cord runs down through your skull. Those are called foramen. So they're like kind of just big holes um, in bone. There's also, so for long bone specifically, there's also what's known as a head, which is kind of where the long bone approximately will um, articulate with other bones. Um, and then for long bones too, there's what's called a diaphysis or shaft, um, which is kind of the long elongated middle portion of the bone. And then the epiphysis, there's actually an epiphysis on both ends. So um, like the head is kind of another name for the epiphysis or, or it's kind of like the epiphysis. There's two epiphysis on each long bone. So there's a diaphysis in the middle and then an epiphysis on each end. Um, and so this here, this 
um, slide kind of goes over a bunch of different ones, but I, I just wanted to highlight some of the main ones about how we um, start thinking about, you know, bones and how to identify them. So when you see a bone, especially a disarticulated bone, which is like just one bone by itself and not in a full skeleton, um, the first thing you want to start doing is being able to identify some of these bony landmarks to help you identify which bone you're looking at. So now that we have an idea of what bone is, I wanted to quickly contrast this with cartilage. Um, you guys are going to learn a lot more about cartilage later in the lecture, but we just kind of wanted to preview it in this one. So cartilage is a soft, elastic, and flexible connective tissue. So you can think about bone as provide, both of these provide structure, right? But bone is very rigid, doesn't move. Cartilage is a little more flexible. It provides, um, you know, some movement abilities. Specifically, you can get things like tension or compression um, or shear forces are all possible with cartilage and, and not possible with bone, right? So that's kind of an important distinction. Um, there's no calcification of cartilage, which is important. And then cartilage is made from chondrocytes as opposed to osteocytes, um, which is what bone is made with. So some um, easy examples of cartilage are your ear, right? So you think about your ear isn't a bone, right? It's kind of flexible, but it still has some sort of structure. So that is an example of cartilage. Your nose is the same way. So kind of the back of your nose or where like kind of attaches to your skull is bone, but then towards the end is actually cartilage because you can bend it, it's movable, um, you can compress it and put tension on it and it's okay. And then another popular or like interesting one that I thought I would bring up is between um, your vertebrae, right? So if you think about, if you just had a one long vertebrae, um, you wouldn't be able to move it, right? Like if you think about your arm, you can't really like the upper part of your arm, you can't move it around. It's not very twisty. There's kind of like one bone that runs. But your spine, you can move your spine, you can bend forward, backwards, side to side, and that's all made possible because the individual vertebrae are connected together with cartilage. So it's kind of a cool. And then also on the ends where bones articulate together. So if you have two bones together, there's a little bit of cartilage on both sides of the bones to reduce the friction, right? Because you don't want bones on bones rubbing together. That causes um, inflammation and that can cause problems. So we have a layer of cartilage on both sides of the bone. That way those bones can articulate together. So that's kind of some um, yeah, places where you'll find cartilage and, and what it's useful for. And like I said, you guys are going to um, learn a lot more about that later tonight. So the next thing that we want to jump into is the axial versus the appendicular skeleton, right? And so this is kind of the bulk of our skeleton. So the way I like to think about the axial skeleton is the axial skeleton is sort of the midline of your body, right? So it's your skull, your vertebrae, your rib cage and sternum, and then all, and then, um, yeah, like all, all of your vertebral column. And then your appendicular, ske appendicular skeleton, or as I like to say, appendages skeleton, right, is your scapula. It's going to be kind of your arms and legs. And then we'll dive into a little bit more about like each of them. But you can kind of think about like your axial skeleton is like the midline. And then your appendicular skeleton is everything on the sides, both of your arms and both of your legs. And so this, this image here, I don't think that you have to know um, all of these. We'll go over exactly which of these bones you need to know. But this does a really great job of highlighting the differences between the um, appendicular and axial skeleton. So we'll start with the axial skeleton. So the first kind of big portion of the axial skeleton is the skull or the cranium, as it's also known. Um, and there's a there's it's really made up of a lot of bones. Um, we've these are kind of the ones that you guys have to know or required to know. Um, and so you have your frontal bone, right? Your parietal bone, um, and then they're all sutured together. So that was just the name of one of the suture, the squamous suture. Um, you have your temporal bone, occipital bone and maxilla and mandible. So the way I like to think about these is your frontal bone is obviously in the front of your skull, right? You have your parietal bone, which is your parent always telling you, you know, what's right and wrong. You got to think as a child. Um, and then your temporal bone is kind of right where your ear is. And so that's an easy way to just get a couple of them quickly. And then kind of a really bad one is, I don't know if if you watch any kind of like war movies, people will always be talking about, I've got your six or like, I've got your back. Um, and so the way I like to think about the occipital bone is instead of I got your six, it's I got your eight, your occipital bone, right? So really poor mnemonic or, you know, memory quip. So do with that what you will. Um, and then you also have your maxilla, which makes up kind of your upper, um, like your upper lip, right? Is your maxilla and then part of your nose. And then your mandible is also known as your jawbone. So, um, 
Um, yeah, that's kind of a quick rundown of, of the skull. And then the next part of the axial skeleton is the vertebrae, right? Um, so the vertebrae is made up of cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacrum, and coccygeal vertebrae, right? And so as we can see here, you have seven cervical vertebrae. There's 12 thoracic vertebrae, which kind of make up um, all of the thoracic vertebrae are associated with ribs. And then there's five lumbar vertebrae. Um, and then what's interesting is that the sacral vertebrae is actually, they're all five of the sacral um, vertebrae are fused together and they create what's known as the sacrum, um, which is kind of neat. And then the coccyx, coccyx is four vertebrae that are fused together. And it's just this tiny little like nubbin right at the end of the sacrum. Um, so kind of yeah, and each so each level has different um, things that are associated with it, right? So the thoracic vertebrae have a longer spinous process, um, where all of the cervical vertebrae have shorter spine uh, have shorter spinous processes. So there's like a few different things that are interesting. But then I also thought that this top down or the superior view um, was a really interesting view, right? You can see the spinous process, and then there's kind of like a body portion of the vertebrae, and then there's the little hole where your spinal cord goes down through. So it's kind of interesting. It's something that I hadn't thought about until I saw pictures of it was where actually does your spinal cord go? And so you kind of have a big body of bone that helps protect it. And then you have a spinal cord that kind of runs down through the middle of it. Um, so yeah, that, so those, that makes up the axial skeleton, right? You have your skull, your vertebrae, and then your rib cage. And then we're going to move on to the appendicular skeleton, right? So you, um, there, there's a couple of um, bones in the chest, the clavicle and scapula. The scapula is technically on your back. Um, and then you have your all of your upper extremity, right? So you have your humerus, your ulna, and your radius, your carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. So what's interesting is that, okay, so you have your humerus, right, right which is the upper part. And then um, if you're in anatomical position, which is, sorry, I don't know if I can do this without standing up, which is your palms outwards like this. Um, that's like an important way to start memorizing it because your ulna and radius will cross over each other as you go back and forth. But when you're in anatomical position, which is standing up palms forward, your radius is all the way on the outside, right? So your radius um, is, is associated with your thumb. So it would be all the way on the outside of your body. And the way that I always remembered that was like, if you think of a circle, the radius is from, or the, the radius is from the middle to the, all the way of the outside of the circle. That's an easy way when you're in anatomical position, the radius is the most outside bone of the body. And then the ona is just the one inside of that. And then, so, and then yeah, the radius and ona um, articulate with the carpal, with the carpal bones. And so those are the bones actually of your wrist, which is kind of interesting to think about. So those bones are more like right in here. And then you actually have long bones called the metacarpals that make up your palm. So your palm is actually made up of long bones. And then it's a lot of, um, muscle and fat over top of it. But the, your palm is actually made up of pretty similar bones to your fingers, which is just kind of weird about, it's just about how the muscles work together um, that makes it feel a lot different than your fingers. So um, you have your carpals, which again is your wrist bones, then your metacarpals, which is the bones in your palms, and then you have your phalanges. Proximal is closest to the palm, middle phalanges, and distal phalanges. And then... Um, the next part of the appendicular skeleton, appendicular skeleton is the os coxa, which is basically like your hip bones. Um, so it's your ischium, your ilium, and your pubis. And they always were really confusing to me. So as you can see on the slide, the ilium is the big yellow one. It's kind of like wing light. Um, it's very broad. And then you have your ischium, which makes up the bottom portion of the loop. And then you have your pubis, which makes up the top portion of the loop. And so these three bones, um, when you like, when you begin um, development, they're actually three separate bones and they fuse into one bone. So it's kind of confusing that we call them three different bones, but the reason is that they originate from three different bones and then, um, yeah, they all fuse together. So your sacrum, like we said, is part of your, um, 
axial skeleton, but the os coxa, these other three bones are, are, are all part of the appendicular skeleton. And then kind of the same way with the arms is we have a long bone, um, more proximal. So we have the femur, and then you have the tibia, which is the bigger bone um, in your lower leg, and then the fibula, which is the smaller bone on the outside in your lower leg. And then the tarsals make up your ankle and some of your heel. And then you have your metatarsals, which make up kind of the arch of your foot. And then the phalanges that make up your toes. And, and the same thing here where the phalanges, there's a proximal and distal phalange um, and then the metatarsal and tarsals. So your wrists and your ankles are actually pretty similar, um, but it's just kind of, yeah, there, there's like small differences, but essentially kind of the same thing, but different. So the next thing that we can do is talk about there's three different types of joints, right? So this is basically the way that bones articulate with each other. So the first kind is a fibrous joint. And so this get, some of these joints can be like a little confusing to think about, um, but fibrous joints are connected by dense fibrous tissue. And the best example of this is the skull, right? So you can think about your skull as your, you have a lot of different bones, but they are all um, very like intricately woven together, right? Like it's so, so hard to pull those apart. It's um, really tough, dense, fibrous tissue that's holding them together. It's a very solid object um, because they're connected, they're connected so well. And then the second type of fibrous joint is actually between, um, is like kind of between two bones, right? So it's called a syndesmosis. So between the ulna and the radius, there's a fibrous joint. So it allows for some movement, but is it's actually a pretty rigid structure, right? It's hard to separate your ulna and radius. Um, they move as one, basically. It's almost like they're one bone, not quite, but they, they move almost as one bone. So they are held together really firmly. Um, so that's kind of the way I like to think about fibrous joints. The next kind of joint we have is called a cartilaginous joint. And so a cartilaginous joint, often there's like a little gap that needs to be filled is the way I like to think about cartilaginous joints. Um, so a couple of common examples of this is in the pubic symphysis. So between the two pubic bones, there's kind of almost like a disc of, of cartilage that holds those together. Um, also in your rib cage, at the front of the front of your ribs are actually not bone. They're connected. Um, your ribs are connected to your sternum through cartilage. Um, so that doesn't mean that they're super movable. It's still very, it's still a very, very hard cartilage, um, but it isn't, it isn't technically bone that they're joined together by. And that just allows for a little bit of movement. Um, they're still very rigid, but they're, there's like kind of like a little bit of movement that's allowed um, in these joints. And so that's how I like to think about a cartilaginous joint. So again, we have fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints. And then when you think of joints, this is the one that you usually think of is the synovial joint, right? Which is it's freely movable. Um, this is like most of the joints in your body or, or I should say a lot of the joints in your body are synovial joints, right? So it allows pretty, it allows really easy movement um, of two bones. And so there's a lot of different kinds of synovial joints, right? You have your, your elbow is a hinge joint. So you, you think about your elbow kind of just goes one way. It doesn't, you can't like go sideways with your elbows. But if you think about um, your arm and kind of your shoulder, like that allows for a lot more movement. So you have a hinge joint in your elbow. You have a ball, um, what we call a ball and socket joint, which is your hip joint and your elbow. They're both examples of ball and socket joints. Um, there's also something called a plane joint, which is where like you have kind of two of the more square bones and, and they like allow movement sort of like this. Um, so yeah, there's a few different types of, of joints. You guys are welcome to like look at this and kind of just think about this. And you, it has some examples. You can think about how they move and um, yeah, some stuff like that. So, but essentially a synovial joint is it's two bones and then there's a, like a layer of cartilage, specifically articular cartilage over the end of both bones. And then the two bones are held together um, by different ligaments. And then kind of inside of that capsule, there's an articular capsule. And inside of that is um, synovial fluid, which is kind of like the oil that allows your bones to move against each other without actually rubbing against each other. Um, yeah, so that, like I said, there's three different types of joints. It's the fibrous, the cartilaginous, and the synovial joint. And that is everything that I had. Thank you, guys. 
Um, if you have any questions, I can try and answer any questions you guys had. Um, but like I said, skeleton is kind of, it's, it's less conceptual. It's more about memorizing things. Um, but yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Well, thank you, Zach. And uh, so we have uh, approximately, well, we've got like almost 15 minutes. If you have questions regarding the skeletal system as well, I encourage you to ask uh, Zach questions about being a medical student or the pathway to uh, medicine, uh, maybe that he took. So uh, feel free to ask different questions here. Uh, Sathwika, I think you have your hand raised, so go ahead and unmute and ask away. Yeah, so I had a question. I've heard of synovial fluid, like, accumulating under the skin. Like, what would be potential consequences of that for the joint? Is there any consequences for it? Oh, so are you talking about, um, um, I don't know if I've heard of this. Maybe Dr. Frank can help me out. I don't know that I've heard of synovial fluid um, specifically being under the skin. Do you mean like, say, if the capsule popped? Yes, I think something like that, or like fluid just accumulating in one part. Like like joint effusion? Is yeah. That... Mm -hmm. think... Right. So maybe Zach, Zach, it's Dr. Peterson. Hello. Um, maybe you could just describe quickly in a degenerative joint kind of disease like osteoarthritis, once you have that breakdown of some of that, as you described it, on the ends of long bones, that cartilage breaking down, that can be really painful. It can lead to inflammation. And part of that inflammatory process is accumulation of more synovial fluid, Sathwika, in the joint. So the joint gets really kind of big and swollen. And that then hampers the movement between the joints. So it's especially um, common at the knee joint and sometimes at the elbow and the shoulder joint. But Zach, you jump in there. Oh, well, that was a wonderful explanation. Let me run back to this slide. So I think that um, kind of the biggest problem, like if you have synovial fluid, say leaking outside of this capsule, right, is it's not, it's not that the synovial fluid itself um, accumulating somewhere is going to cause a lot of problems, but it means that you, you no longer have enough synovial fluid in your capsule here. And so these bones, um, are going to start, like, there's almost like no oil in the machine anymore. And so it's kind of a more of a bone on bone process and that causes a lot of inflammation. And so now your body is like, wait, why is, why do I have a bone on bone problem here? And it's going to make more synovial fluid, which is going to leak out more. And so you're going to, it's kind of like a, it's a really bad cycle, like a negative feedback cycle or a positive feedback cycle that you can get into. Um, but the issues, most of the issues that would arise would be from the bone on bone action and your bones kind of coming under stress and um, it would, yeah, causing the inflammation, which causes, you know, decreased movement. Um, I, I don't know if that hopefully answers your question. Yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Frank, I think you're muted, but go ahead, Michael. You, um, oh, you have your phrase. You can sorry, go sorry. Yeah, um, I was gonna ask. You mentioned that the ends of a bone are the uh, like it's an epiphysis, and I know there's an epiphyseal plate, which is the growth plate, like in the femur. But uh, does every bone have an epiphysis, or is that only the femur with the growth plate, or is that only with growth plates or something? So that's a really great question. So this here, um, so an epiphysis is something that we think about specifically with long bones, right? So this is when you think about um, kind of like your your carpals, your or sorry, your metacarpals, your phalanges in your hand, um, or like the the phalanges in your feet. Like those will all have um, growth plates, and you can actually see on this picture. I don't, can you guys see my mouse? I don't actually know if you can see my mouse. Yeah, okay. Okay, perfect. So you can see the growth plate here, actually, this is where the growth plate would have closed. And so when, when we're looking at this joint, this here would be considered the diaphysis. Um, and then you would have your epiphysis here. Um, and something that we didn't go over is there's a called a metaphysis, um, which is where the epiphysis, sorry, the epiphysis and diaphysis meet. And so that's kind of right in this place. Um, but when we think about growth plates, that's mostly in long bones. Um, and so when we're talking about epiphysis and diaphysis, that's um, 
always referring to long bones. I think that's correct, right, Dr. Peterson? It is, and and maybe you could just describe that during puberty, those uh, those growth plates, those epiphyseal plates close, and then no matter what, you are not getting any taller. So if you think about it, if you have the extension of the length of a bone up until puberty, it means that it's helping you extend the length of the height of your body. So that's why we can be smaller people in kindergarten and we grow to be the size we are in high school but pretty much that's the end of the story. Yeah, and so I think that this is probably uh, a little above um, what you guys need to know, but it's kind of fascinating the way that bones actually start is the growth plate is actually cartilage and the cartilage elongates and then begins calcifying and or begins being replaced by osteocytes, which is the bone cells, and then calcifying. So when you're a teenager, usually sometime in your teenage years, kind of all of the cartilage will run out per se. Um, and then that growth plate, which is the cartilage, will close. And then that's the height that you are for the rest of your life. Okay, I, now I am unmuted. Um, Ryan is asking if you can go back over some of the slides of the lower extremity bones. And Ryan, could you guide uh, Zach on what specifically you'd like to see? It's okay. I, I know that I sprinted through these. Um, so this is, again, the the lower appendicular skeleton, right? So you, again, you have your pelvis um, and it, it, it never made sense to me looking at a 2D image. So I put in the spinning 3D image here, right? But this is your, your os coxa. So it's made up of your ischium, your ilium and a pubis. So again, the ilium is kind of the big wing. And then the pubis is kind of the, the top of this hole, which is called the obturator foramen. Um, kind of the top of that and then towards the midline. So two pubis bones will meet up and then you have your ischium, which makes up the bottom of this um, of this loop or of the obturator foramen. And then this kind of indentation here is called the acetabulum. And that is where your femur will articulate, right? So you can kind of see it on this picture is your femur is a ball and socket joint. And so it kind of sits right into this hole. The head of the femur is where that sits. And then your femur is the long bone of um, the upper portion of your leg. Again, you have your patella, which we talked about a little before, um, sitting inside of those ligaments, helping to reduce friction over your knee. You have your tibia, which is the kind of the, the larger inside bone of your leg, right? And then the fibula is kind of like a supportive bone um, on the, the lateral side of your leg. And these are also connected by a dense fibrous tissue. So you can't see it here, but there's like a dense fibrous tissue that um, holds these two bones together. And then your tarsal bones. Um, I don't actually have a really great picture of it, um, but it's kind of the bones of the back of your heel and a little bit of your ankle, right? So your ankle is where your tibia, fibula, and your tarsal bones articulate. And then you have your metatarsals, which make up kind of the arch of your foot. So the arch of your foot is made up with your tarsal bones and your metatarsal bones, and then your phalanges make up your toes. So you can see for your, your big toe, you actually only have two phalanges. You have a proximal and a distal phalange, but then for all of your other toes, you have a proximal, um, medial, or um, middle and distal phalange. So hopefully that helps clear it up. Um, yeah, I know that I kind of sprinted through this a little bit. It's one of those things where it's like, feels like rote memorization. It's hard to teach, but hopefully that that helps clear it up a little bit. I think Zach too, maybe the question that Rianne had was, okay, so why isn't the sacrum and the coccyx, why aren't they considered part of this pelvis? And I think you said it, that maybe you could just reinforce their, their relationship with the vertebral column. I think that would help. Yeah, absolutely. So the sacrum here, we can see it kind of lo it looks like it should be part of um, the pelvis, right? Because it looks like it's attached here. And the reason that the sacrum is considered part of the axial skeleton, which I can let me see if this will let me go back. 
axial skeleton, right? It has to do with embryology and where these things originate from. So um, the sacrum kind of, they all start as individual bones and then fuse together as you are becoming a human um, in utero, right? And so the sacrum uh, here is kind of, it's considered part of the axial skeleton. It's considered part of the vertebral column, but it is very closely associated with the other hip, uh, the other bones of the pelvis, right? Um, but so yeah, the, the sacrum or these five sacral bones are fused. And then you have the, the four coccygeal bones, which are also fused, but they kind of are just like super small, right? It's like kind of a part of the bone, part of the, part of the body that everybody forgets about. It's not super um, important, kind of like clinically or anything. So it's, it's often a forgotten part, but yeah. So, um, the sacrum is considered part of the vertebral column, um, rather than part of the lower appendicular skeleton. We had another question that was answered in the um, chat, but I, um, I think it'd just be good to make sure that we're saying it vocally too, so that the, the recording picks it up. So um, can you chime in and let us know what's the difference between the pelvis? Why can't we just say the pelvis when we're talking about these versus what does oscoxa actually mean? Um, that might be a Dr. Peterson question. I don't remember what the oscoxa means. So it's just saying that we're talking about today's topic is skeletal anatomy. And so the, the skeletal term is the oscoxa, which refers to the fusion of those uh, three bones there. Um, so there's a, a right and a left of each, um, you know, on each side there. And versus if you're talking about the pelvis, that's talking more about the entire structure, the whole cavity that you have there. Um, so you can, uh, we had someone in the chat say that the oscoxa does make you sound smarter. And I agree it does, because now we're all a little bit smarter for knowing what the hip bone is. Thank you, Dr. Mascara. Oh, um, yeah, I, I had a, uh, another question. You mentioned like for during uh, the growth of the long bone, at least in the femur, probably more, uh, but it's cartilage and then it calcifies into hard bone and is replaced by bone eventually. Why doesn't that happen to like uh, cartilage in your spine or something like that? Is it because it's avascular or? Um, so that's a great question. I think it has to do with signaling pathways. I don't, I don't remember this in detail. Dr. Peterson, do you want to jump in here? So Michael, you're going to be so sorry that you asked this question, but I'm going to give you the simplest answer because it's complicated, but there are different genes that turn on different signaling factors. And some of those factors keep cartilage from transforming and others, their entire job is to target cartilage at the growth plate and transform it over time. And so we typically talk about a signaling factor called SOX9, like, like the red SOX or the white SOX, S-O-X-9. And then that in turn turns on, and you know, creative naming on the part of geneticists turns on a gene called RUNCS, like run and then X, RUNCS. And that is what SOX9 to RUNCS is what stimulates the growth plate to transform by puberty so that those long bones can no longer lengthen. So, but we will never ask you that, but hopefully, that it helps you better understand. It's a complicated process and highly regulated. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you indeed. I feel like I'm learning again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, in the uh, essence of time, we need to move on to our next presenter. Thank you so much, Zach for all of your help and, and words of wisdom. And you can still ask him questions in the comment section um, if you would like. You're not off the hook, Zach. <laughs> okay, all right. So our next presenter is Mackenzie Blackstock. 
and she is going to be presenting on the histology of cartilage and bone. So I think she'll be able to give a little bit more insight to what we were just talking about. So Mackenzie is from Orlando, Florida and graduated from Auburn University with a bachelor's degree in animal science and earned a master's degree from Vanderbilt University in biomedical sciences. She is currently a second year medical student at the Edward Via College of Osteopathic Medicine in Auburn. When not studying, Mackenzie loves to spend time with her husband, Cole, and her dog, Winchester. She loves to cook, Taylor Swift, and she is an avid equestrian. Mackenzie's favorite part of anatomy is gastrointestinal anatomy. So with that, Mackenzie, I give you the floor. Okay, can everybody see my screen? No? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, not quite yet. Uh, we see it loading. Hmm. I did see it, but then it just went away. Okay. Let's, okay, can you see this? Yep. Yep, that's up there. We hold it for long and okay. It looks like every time I try to put it into presenter mode, it says that my screen sharing is paused. Okay. So can you try we, uh, quickly downloading the slides and then um yeah. All right, so it's up again. Senate. Let me please hold. Okay, give me one moment. I apologize for the technical difficulties. And let's wouldn't try. Would it be a Zoom call without them? <laughs> and here's what I'm going to ask while this is all happening. For those of you that are here, can you just use your thumbs up icon? If you are taking an anatomy or physiology course right now in high school or have had one, can you just put a thumbs up? I would love to know how many of you are kind of familiar with this material already. One, okay. Two, can we see? Can we see the PowerPoint? Now I can, yes. Beautiful. Okay. So I see three. I think at some point I saw maybe at least a third of people yeah, here had. I, I, I... Oh, wonderful. Well, without further ado, barring any more technical difficulties, I'm going to talk to everybody about the histology of cartilage and bone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Frank, for the introduction. I am Mackenzie. And I am a second year medical student at VCOM in Auburn. So just to start, our, I'm just gonna run through our learning objectives real quick. Um, we're gonna be describing the microscopic structure and molecular compositions of the three different types of cartilage, which are hyalin, elastic, and fibrocartilage. And I will be correlating these with their locations and their functions, comparing the histological structures, locations, and functions of compact and spongy bone, which are also known as cortical and trabecular bone, describing the organization and structures of an osteon, which is also referred to as a Herbergian system and correlating that with its location and functions. And then we will also compare the histological composition, locations and functions of the periosteum and the endosteum. Okay, so just as a quick overview, um, I know last session, um, you guys talked a little bit about connective tissue um, in histology. So we're gonna kind of build upon that um, and start talking about our histology of tissue and bone. So like I said, there are three different types of cartilage. We have hyaline cartilage, which is this top box up here. And then you can see there's a, like a sketch or a um, depiction here. And then here's an actual histological depiction of hyaline cartilage. And then we have fibrocartilage, and then we also have elastic cartilage. And each types of these cartilage, they have their own unique composition and function. And like Zach talked about in the last session, um, cells of cartilage are called chondrocytes. And 
So these three different types of cartilage can be differentiated based on their appearance, their components, and by the presence or absence of a perichondrium, and that is an outer fibrous layer of connective tissue that we will talk about momentarily. So starting off, we're going to chat about hyaline cartilage. So hyaline cartilage is the most common type of cartilage in the body. It's very strong and very flexible, and it's located on the ends of bones where they meet movable joints, nose, rib, the rib cage, the trachea, and many other locations as well. And so you can see here, can you guys see my arrow? Okay, wonderful. Yes. So over here on the right, we have our hyaline cartilage, and these have a dense regular connective tissue layer, which is referred to as the perichondrium, that sits above. And this serves as a key role during the growth and repair of the cartilage. And the perichondrium has fibrocytes in it. And hyaline cartilage is typically stained when you look at histological slices like we have here um, with a H and E stain which is uh, hematoxylin and eosin. It's a uh, acidic and basic stain that'll attach to different components of the cells and give you the colors that you can see. And now we're gonna talk about elastic cartilage, which looks very similar to hyaline cartilage in this image. However, these uh, types of cartilage are differentiated based off the types of stain that you can use. Um, so very nicely, the stain that you can use to see elastic cartilage on histology is called an elastin stain. And elastic cartilage is found in areas that can bend frequently. It readily returns to its normal position and it's only differentiated from hyaline cartilage when it's stained. And some locations of elastic cartilage are your auditory canal, so your ear canal, um, the external ear, the external auditory meatus, which is like the hole that my AirPod is sitting in right now, epiglottis, and then there's a couple others. So elastic cartilage, very common in the ear. So like you said, if you move your ear, it moves back to the normal position. And if anybody like myself has a cartilage piercing in their ear, that is what is pierced is the elastic cartilage. And a good point to make when, if you guys are looking at uh, the PowerPoint, when you're studying and you can kind of zoom in on the image, um, the chondrocytes of elastic cartilage are a little bit flatter and more pointed. Um, and that's another way that you can differentiate elastic versus hyaline cartilage, aside from just the stain that you're using. And now we're gonna talk about the third and strongest type of cartilage, which is fibrocartilage. And its arrangement allows for compression and shear forces, which is why it is the strongest type of cartilage because it really undergoes a lot of stress and because it's associated with joint cartilage. So examples of this are the meniscus of the knee, the intervertebral discs of your spine, your pubic symphysis, your sacroiliac joint and other joints in your body. And a uh, kind of side note, that the meniscus of the knee is something that's very commonly torn um, with knee injuries and in athletics. Um, so you are not tearing a ligament in your knee like with your ACL, you are actually tearing a cartilaginous um, pad that sits in your, uh, in your knee joint. And there's not classically a perichondrium associated with fibrocartilage. However, depending on the location of the joint, there might be. And the matrix that is associated with your fibrocartilage. Um, the fibers will kind of follow in the direction of the compression and the shear that the joint is experiencing. And now we're gonna move on to the differences between spongy and, or trabecular and compact and cortical bone. So as you can see up here in this image, our spongy bone is up kind of within, lies within the typical bone that you think of, and then your compact bone is more on the external portion. And then if you look over here, your the structure of your, or the arrangement of your spongy bone and your compact bone differs a little bit in the skull because your spongy bone is sandwiched in, it's like a layer 
um, between two layers of compact bone, whereas the compact bone of like your long bones, which is what's shown here, it's more circles around it. It's not as much of a layered system. So our compact bone and our spongy bone. Um, compact bone is the strongest of the two types, which if you think about it, makes sense because it sits more externally on the bone where a spongy bone is more internal. It's very dense to withstand its compression force and it provides support and protection. And it is, you can see here in this histological image that it's typically, its functional unit is a osteon or a haversian system, which we're gonna go into a little bit more depth on, I believe it's the next slide. And then we have our spongy bone, which is comprised of more open spaces, um, which supports shifting and weight distribution. Cells are arranged in a more lattice type network called trabeculae, which you can sort of imagine by looking here, it's kind of lattice-like, um, but this is what makes our bones lighter so they can move easier. And some spaces can contain red marrow, which is what produces our red blood cells. Now talking about compact bone specifically, the microscopic structural unit of compact bone is called an osteon or a haversian system. And the haversian system has many different components that make it up. And you can see over here in this image, it does a really good job at pointing out those individual uh, components as well as the osteon as a whole. There are a lot more things on this image that is a little bit above uh, pay grade for what we need to know for this lecture, but I'm going to point out the most important things, which are also listed over here. So you have your um, lamellae, which are just, you can see here, it's just the layers. Um, so that's kind of how I like to think of it is Lamellae kind of sounds like layers, and that's the layers of calcified matrix. And then you have a central canal, which runs down the center of each osteon. And it can also be called the Haversian canal. And it contains the important blood, lymphatic vessels, and nerves that run through each. So you can kind of see the yellow, blue, and red poking out of each osteon coming through that central canal. And then you also have a perforating or a Volkman canal, which connects your periosteum with the endosteum of the bone. And then the lacunae are spaces found at the border of each adjacent lamellae. And this is what contains the actual osteocytes, um, which are a cell of the bone. And then, Canaliculi are these microscopic channels in the compact bone that allow long cytoplasmic extensions of osteocytes to connect to one, one another. So it's a canal that allows for connections. And these canal canaliculi allow for nutrients to be transported and for waste to be removed. And then there's also a histological representation of one of these aversion systems right down here. So you can see the big old central canal right there. And then, so this is, I wanted to just give a little bit more time towards the aversion system. Um, I thought this was a really good depiction to have because it shows the histology and then it has a sketch transferred over with everything labeled. Um, so I thought this would be something really good to go back and for you guys to have to go back and look on. And again, you can see here that we have some osteons all over here. Here is what the perforating canal will actually look like, um, which is uh, kind of cool to see um, both osteons and the perforating canal on the same slice. And then you have central canal and then the lacunae, if you can zoom in on these images, um, would sit right about in there. So you can kind of see it better over on this one in there. And then your osteocytes sit within those lacunae. 
And so now we're just going to talk about the differences between endosteum and periosteum. So endosteum is right here on the image. And then your periosteum is right here. So these are two more um, layers per se. Um, but before we talk about dive into talking about those, I wanted to talk about the medullary cavity for a moment. So kind of this portion right here. And your medullary cavity is a long hollow cavity that connects your epiphys and your diaphysis of the bone, um, like what you guys had spoken about, Zach had talked to you guys about. And the medullary cavity is filled with spongy bone and it can either be red bone marrow, which you see more commonly in infants to young adults, actively producing uh, red blood cells. And then as we age, your red marrow transitions into yellow bone marrow, which is predominantly fat. So you can see here that this image has chosen to portray the yellow bone marrow. So our periosteum and our endosteum, we'll start with the periosteum over here. It is a fibrous membrane that covers the outer surface of the bone. It does contain some blood and lymphatic vessels, um, as well as some nerves. And this is where your tendons and your ligaments attach physically to the bone. And it can cover the entire outer surface of the bone, except where your epiphysis will meet the other, will meet other bones. And then over here, you can see the endosteum is more of a membranous lining of that medullary cavity, which we just talked about. And this is where bone growth, repair, and remodeling can occur. And to give a nice histological representation of the periosteum, you can see here. So this image is stained with that H&E, the hematoxylin and eosin. Stain, um, that we talked about previously when looking at the cartilage. And you can see here is a layer of periosteum. And then here is the bone. And periosteum serves two distinct functions. Um, the generation of osteoblasts for growth and repair of bones. And then it also aids in the transfer of forces and muscle attachment. And your periosteum, as you can see here, in this image has two layers. Um, there's a more outer, more fibrous layer, which its predominant cell type are fibrocytes. And then there's an inner cellular layer, which has osteoprogenitor cells and osteoblasts. And the osteoprogenitor cells are the, they can be progenitors to osteoblasts. So it's like the precursor cell, which can then, uh, transition into an osteoblast to aid with uh, growth and repair of the bone. And then for our endosteum, uh, it's our members lining um, that covers this entire surface of all trabeculae. And so it covers the inner surface of the bone and in a resting adult bone, your endosteal cells are, they're a squamous type of cell and they include silent osteoblasts as well as those osteoprogenitor cells. But during bone modeling and repair, the osteoprogenitor cells can, they will replicate and differentiate into osteoblasts. So you can see up here that we have um, some of these osteoblasts being depicted down here. And then are some of these initial squamous endosteal cells. So this would be in a resting adult bone, you would have these squamous endosteal cells. And then during periods of bone modeling and repair, this is what uh, they can differentiate to, is into these uh, more cuboidal osteoblasts. And those are my references. And I believe that is all that we have to cover. So if there's any questions uh, on this topic or anything, anything else, I'm I'm here and happy to answer whatever you guys may have. Uh, 
Yeah, I had a had a few questions. Um, so you mentioned for like the, I think the fibro cartilage, it doesn't have, does not have the chondrocytes or like uh, whatever it was, uh, perichondrium. It doesn't ha commonly right. have the perichondrium. So does that mean it doesn't have the ability to heal as well as the other types of cartilage? I am. I would love if uh, one of uh, either Dr. Pascara or Dr. Frank or Dr. Peterson would uh, take this, but I believe yes, it that does. it doesn't have. That's, that's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly right. It means that because there is no perichondrium, there's really no outermost blood supply. So fibrocartilage is. And we should probably make this really clear, Michael, and I'm glad you're asking this. So bone is highly vascularized and all types of cartilage, even if they have a perichondrium, are really limited, especially internally in the gel-like matrix of cartilage. There really is no substantial blood supply. So in a in a <laughs> in the karmic universe, if you know somehow you get a choice of whether you break a bone or tear through some cartilage, you always want to choose bone because it's got that blood supply. It will repair much faster and much more efficiently where that's not true with cartilage, but it's even less true for fibrocartilage as you picked up on because there is no perichondrium. It has of all three types of cartilage, the most limited blood supply, which really then minimizes growth and repair. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I also had a question on like, you mentioned for that, uh, I think it was fibro, it might've been hyaline cartilage, like uh, in response to the stresses, it the cells actually tend to arrange themselves in certain ways. Is that like, um, is that based on use or is that a natural thing? Like if you go up into International Space Station, does that change? Or if you live there all your life, would it change? Or is it like a natural arrangement? Dr. Peterson, I would love for you to, because I'm, I'm actually really not sure about that. That's a really wonderful question. Right. So what is changing or altering is the directionality, Michael, of the collagen fibers in that matrix. So um, those are laid down by those living cells, which uh, McKinsey correctly identified as the chondrocytes. And they are laying down that collagen as time goes by, by different they're they're directed in their orientation in the matrix by mechanical stress forces. So it's individual and unique to each of us to a certain extent based on our activities of daily life. Okay. McKinsey, if you'll let me, one of the things I was just going to mention to everyone is that sometimes if you understand prefixes um, for root words or suffixes, that can be really, really helpful. So I was just going to point out to everyone um, and for the recording that the prefix peri, P-E-R-I, means around or surrounding, and the prefix para, even though it sounds similar, Para as a prefix P-A-R-A -A, means close to or next to. So they're spelled similarly, they sound similar, but they really mean two different things as prefixes. So in using that for the perichondrium, the perichondrium surrounds or wraps around all of the cartilage that we're talking about. We have a periosteum, on the surface of the bone that McKinsey mentioned. And that too, peri means that it surrounds the entire outermost surface of whatever bone we're talking about. And then lastly, I was gonna mention these, these suffix endings that we keep using. So the blast, B-L-A-S-T suffix ending, usually is indicative of an immature cell type, 
that's really metabolically active and typically mitotically active. And then the site suffix ending typically means it's a more mature, terminally differentiated cell type where it's really just in that state of homeostasis. Its metabolic activity has really slowed down and typically they're not mitotically active unless, again, there's some trauma and they need to grow and or repair. And then the final one is the one that McKenzie mentioned in relationship to bone. So the CLAST, C-L-A-S-T suffix ending is indicative of degradative cell types. So osteoclasts are breaking down bone, helping to remodel it, where an osteoblast is an immature cell type that typically is laying down a lot of new, in the case of osteoblast, new bony matrix. In the case of cartilage, we would call those chondroblasts. And then the more mature cell types, osteocyte or chondrocyte are the, are the ones that are just there to maintain whatever has already um, has already been laid down as far as that tissue. So hopefully that helps. When somebody first explained that to me, I was like, oh my gosh, game changer. So yay. Okay, we have a question from Macy. Uh, for the actual anatomy B, will we need to be able to identify the different parts of the haversion system and types of cartilages from the microscopic images as shown in the slides? So Dr. Peterson and Dr. Pascara, could you handle that? Yeah, so one thing I just want to um, call out to you guys is if, if um, you haven't been to the anatomy website, there's a lot of really awesome stuff on there to help you guys figure out what you need. So part of those you might have noticed was the learning objectives. Um, if you go to the resources and forms tab and click on learning objectives, um, you can see that the first three is anatomy, histology, and embryology learning objectives. And right below that, you can see that there's a couple of checklists there. So the first one is going to be your anatomy checklist. And then the second one then is going to be your uh, histology checklist. So um, anything that you're concerned about that you would need to know, um, you know, exactly how detailed is pretty much laid out there in terms of the depth. Um, I can tell you that osteon or uh, version system is on there, but the specifics of it is not. Um, so anytime you have any of those questions, we've got a nice, um, you know, list there for you that you can refer to. I don't know if Dr. Peterson has anything else you wanted to add to that. I do, Dr. Priscura. So I just wanted to mention to everyone, including um, the faculty, that we have a DUCOM student who agreed to put together a nice little picture atlas, a photographic atlas of everything on the histology checklist. And he emailed me today and he said, he's almost finished, should be a couple of days, and then we'll put it up on the Anatomy website. And I think all of you will find that really helpful. It's just um, a PowerPoint with page after page of a tissue type, what you need to know from the checklist labeled on those individual um, photo micrographs, a photograph taken through a microscope. So I hope that will be really helpful. And that should be up, I would say, by Halloween. So Mackenzie. Great to hear. Mackenzie, can you go back to the spongy bone slide? And Bridget, could you ask your question? Um, I just am taking notes for some people that aren't able to be here. So I just wanted to see that one more time so I could understand it better. Of course. Is there anything specific or do you, is just the slide, having the slide up good for you? Yeah, I think seeing the difference between the two is helpful, like them side okay, by side. Perfect. Okay, um, Michael. You have your hand raised. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I had, had a couple more questions. Um, you mentioned so basically, like each osteon has a central canal where the uh, like the blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and the nerves go through. Is there? Are they all rough? Like, if you have a, a long bone, like the femur, are they all roughly the same size in each osteon, or is it different? Like, is there like a major central one? Um, and then also, you you mentioned the 
periosteum is also like it's it has those nerves and vessels running through it does that mean like is the periosteum also made of uh, osteons as well so michael i can take your first question and then mckenzie I, I bet you got the second one but if you need some help i'll jump in so the first question, and this is goofy, maybe if you go to the slide just before this, McKenzie, where you had the little sketch of the osteon. Yes, this one. So I, I'm not part of the screen sharing, so you might have to help me here, McKenzie. But you can see that in the central canal, or what is called, again, the Herversion Canal, like McKinsey was pointing out, they always put a red and a blue and a yellow little uh, a rod there, a vessel. That is so misleading. So we're at the microscopic level here. So this is magnified 100 to 1,000 times with what you're seeing at the bottom of that, um, of that image on the PowerPoint. So really, all of the blood vessels in the Haversian canals are going to be capillaries because this is where gases are being exchanged and uh, nutrients are being exchanged for waste. Now, I think a better question, Michael, would have been, are all the vessels in those perforating or Volkmann's canals the same? And those that's a little bit trickier because those are going to be larger blood vessels like arterioles and venules the capillaries branch from. So those sizes can be somewhat variable. And then I'm gonna let McKinsey answer your periosteum question, but I'll help you if you need it. <laughs> so from, um, so the periosteum is an outer, it's a connective tissue layer that lies on top of your compact bone. So your compact bone has your osteons and that's the functional unit. And then your periosteum is a membranous layer that lays on top of it. Um, so it itself does not have osteons, but the components that are a part of the compact bone uh, can be interwoven in that uh, periosteum. How I was understanding it, but please, Dr. Peterson, I would... Uh, Love your uh, take on that as well, just to make sure it's uh, understood. Yeah, and so I think uh, perfect. The the way I would think of the periosteum is kind of like a um, a netting, almost like you know a little uh, ballerina's tutu. So it's a fibrous kind of meshwork that has um, fibrocytes. So those are fibroblasts, like we talked about last time, that are producing those fibers and the gel-like portion of the matrix. It's highly vascularized, so it's got um, arteries, veins, and nerves, as well as lymphatics. And that's really important because the layer of mesh right below it, as McKinsey said, it's two layers. The layer right below it, think of it as the stem cell layer for bone cells. So we need them to stay viable or healthy. That's why the blood supply is snuggled right up next to those osteoprogenitor cells. And then if you think about it, Michael, and again, a great question. So not only do bones as, as, as children grow to be young adults and you move through puberty, not only do your bones have to get longer, they would be very unstable if they also didn't in increase in diameter. And it's that second deeper layer of the periosteum that allows the growth in diameter of our long bones. So that was an excellent question. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, are there any other questions? I don't see anything in the, in the chat, but if anybody has anything else, or Mackenzie, then I will let you off the hook. Then thank you for uh, your presentation and words of wisdom this weekend. Um, please stick around to the end as there may be more questions coming. And so <clears throat> without further ado, uh, our third presenter this evening is Marquise Winston. 
and he is going to be presenting on the embryology section uh, for this week on gastrulation. So Marquise is from Killeen, Texas and graduated from Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas in 2018 with a bachelor's of science in microbiology. He then went on to complete a master's of science in biology at Chatham University in Pittsburgh, uh, which they just won this evening, the Steelers, go Steelers. He is currently a second year medical student at Drexel University College of Medicine in Pennsylvania. Marquise is interested in pediatric hematology and oncology. And when he is not studying, he enjoys hanging with friends, watching movies, and working out. So, without further ado, uh, I introduce and Marquise, the floor is yours. Awesome. So, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, can you guys see my screen, all my tabs? Okay. Uh, okay. I think Mackenzie had to download the slideshow. Oh no, yours looks like it's going right into it. it working? Okay, great. That's what I like to see. All right, guys. So, like Dr. Frank said, I'm Marquise. I'm going to be presenting on gastrulation for you guys. Oh. Okay, there we go. So, the learning objectives or the lecture objectives, let's say are to describe the transformation of a bilaminar disc into a trilaminar disc, identify the primary derivatives of the ectoderm, and explain where blood cells form at different stages of development, identify the general anatomic derivatives of the endoderm. Okay, so during week two of embryogenesis, the embryo is implanted to the endometrium of the uterus, once implanted, the blastocyst begins to differentiate into two distinct layers called the embryoblast, and that's also called the inner cell mass. And this eventually becomes the embryo. And then the trophoblast, which is also called the outer cell mass, um, this provides nutrients for the embryo and develops into a large part of the placenta. And then the middle of week two, the embryoblast and trophoblast undergo further differentiation. And then the embryoblast differentiates into the epiblast, which is a single layer of epithelium that gives rise to three germ layers. And then the hypoblast, which gives rise to the yolk sac, and the trophoblast further differentiates into the cytotrophoblast and the syncytiotrophoblast. And so, can you guys see my cursor? Okay, yes. so, okay, awesome. So, the photo uh, or the image, I should say, on the bottom right is just showing kind of what I just explained to you guys. So, I can see that it's implanted to the endometrium, and then you can see the embryonic disc, which has or consists of the hypoblast and the epiblast, and then you can see the trophoblast which consists of the cytotrophoblast, the syncytiotrophoblast. And then something you can also see is something called the amnion and the amnionic cavity. And so the amnion is going to be inside, the, it's like amnionic fluid, it's going to be inside of the amnionic cavity. And then the embryo, the growing, developing embryo is going to be kind of submersed inside of the amnionic fluid in the cavity. Okay, so next, what is gastrulation? So once implantation has occurred, the cells start proliferating and dividing, and at week three, gastrulation occurs, which is the process of converting the two-layered or bilaminar embryonic disc into a three-layered or trilaminar embryonic disc, in which the tissues and organs develop from. So gastrulation begins with the appearance of a transient structure called the primitive streak and primitive node and the epiblast of the bilaminar embryonic disc. And so that bilaminar embryonic disc starts to take the shape of an oval and forms an indentation which is the, prim the primitive streak along the cranial or the head part of the surface of the epiblast, and a node at the caudal or the tail end of the primitive streak, which is the primitive node, emits growth factors that direct cells to multiply and migrate and form the endoderm layer. And so as you can see at the bottom kind of, the, um, of my slide, the image, so this is going to be the bilaminar disk that I was talking to you guys about. And then you can see in the middle, it's going to be the primitive streak. And then at the top where the caudal end, it's going to be the primitive node. And caudally to, oh, sorry, cranially to the primitive node, it's going to be those epiblastic cells. And like I was saying, the blast cells kind of go into the pr primitive node, and then they're going to form that endoderm. 
And as you can see, the endoderm is going to be right at the bottom. And as you can see also, it's going to be the, you're going to see the mesoderm and the ectoderm. So this means that the bilaminar disc already turned into the trilaminar disc. And then we're going to talk about what the ectoderm and the mesoderm is in a moment. And so I just have some more pictures that kind of show you a little bit more in detail of how the cells kind of move into the primitive node. And so, as you can see at the bottom right image, um, you see the cross section of the trilaminar disc at this point, and you can see the cells going into the primitive node and forming the endoderm and then the trilaminar uh, disc. And so you can see where my cursor is. This is going to be the endoderm, these cells are going to be forming the mesoderm, and this is going to be the ectoderm. Okay, so continue the trilaminar embryonic disc. So cells from the epiblast then migrate toward and through the primitive streak and move laterally to create two new layers of cells, totaling up to three. So the first layer is the endoderm, which is a sheet of cells that displace the hypoblast and lies adjacent to the yolk side. The second layer of cells that fills in as the middle layer is the mesoderm, and then the cells of the epiblast that remain and have not migrated through the primitive streak will then become the ectoderm. And so I don't know why, but I guess I like all my images on the bottom right of my screen. So if you look back over here, you can also see the um, the ectoderm, the ectoderm is going to be in the blue, and then you can see the mesoderm is going to be the red right in the middle, and then you can see the endoderm right here, and it's kind of also like connected to the yolk sac. And then down here, you can see what the, these layers start to become, um, but we're going to also talk about that soon, soon as in right now. So the endoderm is, um, like I said, epiblast cells that replace the hypoblast cells, hypoblastic cells and it forms the endoderm. And then the endoderm is gonna form the lining of the digestive tract and its derivatives. And so it's gonna form like the parotid glands, the submandibular glands and other glands that are, um, that are derivatives of the digestive tract. They also form the lining of the respiratory tract. And so I put a little lung right here just to show something of the respiratory tract. It's gonna um, form the lining of the respiratory tract and derivatives. It's going to form the liver and the pancreas. And so I have a liver and a pancreas just to show you guys what that looks like. And it's also going to form the lining of the genitourinary tract. So it's going to form the lining of the urinary bladder, the urethra, and the lower two thirds of the vagina. And so that's going to, that's the endoderm. And so for the mesoderm, it's going to form. Um, it's the epiblast cells form the mesoderm. And so the mesoderm is going to form most of the bones and the muscles. And so I have a little skeleton on the right here. Um, it also forms a heart and blood cell and blood vessels. And so I have a little heart right here. It also forms the lining of body cavities and also the dermis of the skin. It also forms kidneys and ureters and then the gonads and the ducts. And so there is a very small group of epiblast. There's a very small group of epiblast cells that migrate early into the primitive streak and establish a line of cells called primordial primordial germ cells. And these cells will migrate from the primitive streak to the posterior wall of the yolk sac, where they will undergo suppression and gene suppression of gene expression. And so, what that means basically is the activity of the gene has been turned down or stopped, and it prevents the, it it prevents it from making the protein it normally produces. And it isn't until the week, it isn't until the fourth week of, de of development where these cells migrate from the posterior wall of the yolk sac and into the, the developing gonads where the process of the metogenesis occurs. And so you guys learned what the metogenesis is a few weeks ago, I believe. And so that's going to be the mesoderm. And so the ectoderm is the remaining epiblast, epiblast cells. Um, and these form the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And so on the right, I put a little nervous system that you can see all the nerves flowing through the body and also the brain. It forms the epidermis of the skin. And so something that you guys should definitely remember is the mesoderm forms the dermis of the skin and then the ectoderm forms the epidermis of the skin. And I guess an easy way to remember that is epidermis, ectoderm, both start with ease. So it's kind of a little learning tool. 
And so the ectoderm also forms the pituitary gland, um, and then the retina, lens, the iris, the cornea of the eye. Okay, so now we're going to be talking about hematopoiesis. And what hematopoiesis is, is the production of blood cell. Oh, sorry. There we go. Okay. So the, myelo the myeloid lineage originates from the bone marrow, and depending on what growth factors they come into contact with, these cells differentiate and mature. They form. Um, so we're going to go to this chart. So like I said, the myeloid stem cells can form either one of these three. And so we're going to start with the megakaryoblasts. So megakaryoblasts are going to further differentiate into platelets, and platelets initiate blood clotting. And so if you like cut your knee and you're bleeding, and as you can, and when you wait a few days, it stops bleeding. You can see that little scab. That's going to be the platelets working to manage it. And so we're going to go next to it. Proerythroblasts is going to further differentiate into erythrocyte, and an erythrocyte is a red blood cell. And so we know red blood cells of of sending oxygen to different parts of our bodies and oxygenating them. So then it can um, differentiate into a myoblast, which differentiates these cells down here, which we call the white blood cells, basophil, neutrophil, and eosinophils. And these are immune cells. We'll talk about that a little more. And then lastly, a monoblast, which turns into a monocyte, and then a macrophage. And so for macrophages, we call macrophages kind of the, um, like the garbage disposal of, of the body. So say, you have like a foreign a foreign body or bacteria in your body. Um, the macrophage comes, eats it up, and then when you see like pus coming from like your wound, that's going to be these macrophages along with some neutrophils doing their job. Something that I also found pretty interesting uh, to note is during the first couple months, the hematopoietic activity is occurring in the yolk sac, and then from months two to seven. Um, it is the fetal liver and spleen that is taking over the hematopoietic function. And then cells from the liver will then colonize the bone marrow. And in the seventh month of gestation, the bone marrow begins to take over and the process of the take over the process. And then at birth, blood cell formation and maturation is restricted to the bone marrow. That's something that I found pretty important. And then um, hematopoiesis begins in the blood islands found on the surface of the yolk sac and then transitions to other organs, like I was saying. And so I like pictures. I feel like pictures are pretty helpful. And so I have a pictures of some cells. And so all of these, these are going to something that we call peripheral blood smears. And so if you like get your blood taken, put it on a slot, microscopic slide, these are going to be the cells that you're going to see. And so if you go to the top left, you see some a lot of really pink ish red cells. So all these are going to be your red blood cells. And then you see my cursor right here. The cell looks like there's some dark basophilic looking stuff on the inside. And so these are going to be the nuclei, uh, the multi-lobe nuclei. And you see that it's four. And then the cytoplasm isn't as pink as the red blood cells, but it's still pretty pink. And so what we call these are neutrophils. And then neutrophils are phagocytic and they are the most common leukocyte of the immune cells, of the white blood cells. And then if you go to the left, you see another multi-lobed multi um, cell. And then it's still, it's, you can see the cytoplasm is kind of similar in color, eosinophilic color as the red blood cells. And so what we call these, or we're going to call them eosinophils. And so eosinophils are also phagocytic, and they have to do a lot with um, like allergies and then parasitic infections. And so if you go down to the bottom where you see my cursor, I just put a photo of red blood cells. So these are what they look like. They have a little biconcave shape. And if you go to where my cursor is to the top right, once again, you see this peripheral blood smear. You see a lot of red blood cells. And you see this little dark basophilic looking cell right here. You can barely see the nuclei or the nucleus. And you see that the cytoplasm is really basophilic and is kind of speckly. And so that corresponds to the basophils. And then basophils promote inflammation and are the least common leukocyte. And then lastly, you go to the bottom right. Um, you see this really big cell with these little cells kind of like on the outside. 
And these are going to be, this is gonna, the big cells, the megakaryocyte, and then the cells on the outside are going to be the platelets that it's releasing. Okay, so you reproduce this as something a little more specific. Oh, sorry. It's a little more specific. So erythropoiesis is by definition the formation and maturation of red blood cells. So erythropoiesis occurs in the bone marrow in a particular compartment called the hematopoietic compartment. And this compartment contains a multitude of cells and connective tissue um, that's out of the scope of what we're talking about today. But it also contains these things called erythroblastic islets or islands, which uh, macrophages reside and provide hematopoietic growth factors necessary for the development of the erythrocyte and phagocytizes, phagocytizes sorry, the extruded nuclei of the erythrocytes. And I think it's also important to note to make to understand the distinction between blood islands and erythroblastic islands. And so just to reiterate, blood islands are structures that play a role in the formation of blood vessels and the circulatory system during development, while erythroblastic islands are specialized microenvironments within the bone marrow where erythropoiesis occurs. And so um, this little picture that I put is just, um, like I said, uh, from month seven to birth and then from birth on out, um, hematopoiesis, hematopoiesis is going to be occurring in your bones and bone marrow. And so this is just showing that. And also right here with the uh, erythroblastic islands, they produce cell signals for differentiation. They supply iron for heme, and then they phagocytize extruded nuclei. And then the process, like I said, it, um, it has specific like cell stimulating factors that it has to um, that it has to undergo. And so one of those stimulating cell factors is erythropoietin, and that um, stimulates erythropoiesis. And so morphology of the ure erythropoietic cells. And this is a little overview. And so this is something that I added in just so it gives you kind of like a bird's eye view, like when you're looking at um, like a slide, you're just like, oh, I don't know what I'm looking at. Specifically, when you're looking at like erythropoietic, like erythropoiesis, like if it's a immature red blood cell or a mature blood cell, you want to see if the cell, if well, the trend and development of red blood cells, the cells go from big to smaller. So the immature cells are bigger than the mature um, blood cells. The cells go from darker staining purple to a pink salmon color due to the accumulation of hemoglobin. So the more mature the red blood cell gets, the more hemoglobin that it accumulates or that it makes, and then the pinker it gets. And then a mature red blood cell has no nucleus. So once you see the pictures that I show you, it'll be kind of obvious. Um, you won't see a nucleus. And so when you look at this photo right here, you can see that the red blood cells are around it. And you see that there is a little cell with the nucleus in it. So you can assume that it is a immature red blood cell. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, the actual erythropoiesis. And so firstly, um, erythropoiesis starts with a pro -erythroblast. And so a pro erythroblast is the first microscopically, microscopically recognizable committed erythrocyte precursor cell. Um, it's not readily recognizable in bone marrow smears. So you have to, and then they have a moderately basophilic uh, cytoplasm. So you can see um, with this little cartoon I have, the pro, -erythro the pro erythroblast, the cytoplasm is pretty blue. And the cytoplasm, the cytoplasm to nucleus ratio is pretty low. So that's also something that's pretty important. So next, you're going to see a base, next in the erythropoiesis is going to be a basophilic erythroblast. And so these arise from pro erythroblasts via mitosis. And it is smaller than the pro erythroblast, even though in this cartoon it looks bigger than the pro erythroblast. Just trust me that it's smaller. Um, and it, it, it has intensely basophilic philic cytoplasm and has small amounts of hemoglobin. And so as you can see, um, the cytoplasm is basophilic, just like the probrethoblast, but it's starting to make hemoglobin. And so next is the polychromatophilic erythroblast, um, and the cytoplasm is both basophilic and eosinophilic due to the hemoglobin. It has condensed chromatin, chromatin being um, the nucleus. Um, and no nucleolus, and is still capable of mitosis. 
and the granules are checkered. So something that you can see that kind of signifies that it's a polychromatic ruthoblast is the checkerboard pattern. Um, so that's going to be the checkerboard pattern of the nucleus. And so next, you're going to go to a different slide. The next slide, it's going to be the orthochromatophilic erythroblast. And it's also called a normal blast. And it has a cynophilic cytoplasm due to a large amount of hemoglobin. It has a small, compact uh, nucleus and is not capable of mitosis. So the polychromatic erythroblast is the last immature red blood cell precursor that can undergo mitosis. And so as you can see with the orthochromatic erythroblast, it's very pink, way pinker than the previous um, cytoplasm. So that's just meaning that um, more hemoglobin is accumulating in the cytoplasm. You can also see that the nucleus is kind of, well, not kind of, it's off center. It looks like it's coming out of the cytoplasm. And that's going to be important because um, when it turns start when it turns into a reticular site, the nucleus is going to be extruded from the cytoplasm. And so since I'm talking about the reticular site, we can go on to the reticular site, which also says that the nucleus has been extruded from the cell. And it's ready to pass into these things called sinusoids, which is basically a blood-filled space um, commonly found in tissues and organs, um, which has nutrient that exchanges nutrients, oxygen, and other things in this little space. And then lastly, a erythrocyte, it's going to be a red blood cell, which is a mature red blood cell. Um, like you can see the nucleus is extruded and you can see it has a biconcave um, um, morphology, sorry. And then that's it. Um, I hope I didn't talk too fast. Nope, you were very efficient though. <laughs> so uh, Michael, go ahead and ask your question okay uh ooh. um yeah the uh so i had a question um you kept mentioning like uh in particular there was one where you were like uh for two to seven months fetal mm -hmm. liver and spleen are going through a hematopoiesis but they you said they travel to the marrow um the red marrow and that eventually takes over but but when you say they travel, do you mean like the cells actually traveled or do you mean like set new cells were made in a different location, which eventually takes over or like, what is that traveling process? Same thing with like, it would travel to the gonads eventually for the primordial stem cells or. So from my understanding with the primordial stem cells, they actually travel to the gonads like the cells because like dr peterson was saying with um with the like signaling um factors and stuff the signaling there's certain six signaling factors that tell the pro promoter cells that hey they go to the gonads and so they follow and go to the gonads and so when talking about the um with the um bone marrow i believe it's because it says when i was reading that uh, um the liver cells colonize into the bone marrow. So from that, from my understanding, I would think that the cells also travel to the bone marrow or is it kind of the same thing with like the stimulating factors, Dr. Peterson? So it is, and you're exactly right. So they are being circulated, those stem cells that you were talking about, those pro-erythroblastic cells, those stem cells are literally going to be moved from location A in the liver and spleen. Some of those will move into the red bone marrow, populate it, and take a permanent residence there, and then start the mitotic process, generating all of those then precursor cells, ultimately terminating in red blood cells. And the interesting thing, and I'm sure Marquise would have said this, Michael, is that under certain conditions, you can actually have uh, the liver, if, if there's an issue with your red bone marrow, the liver can take over the functions of producing red blood cells and white blood cells again. So that that's pretty cool. Uh, uh, can that do that for adults or is that for like for infants or uh, in utero? Right. And so it's a complicated story, but 
what also we should, I'll, I'll just say this quickly, you'll never get tested on this, but again, this is all amazing, right? These processes, we think of these pictures in the textbooks that we study from and everything looks like it's static and it's there and it never changes. And really what we understand about the human body is that throughout our, our lifespan, many, many things are changing and moving and they get to a certain place and then under certain conditions, it can all change again and they can move back or move to other locations. So for instance, my point of this was to say that as we age in our medullary cavities that Mackenzie was talking about in the shaft of our long bones, we initially have red bone marrow there. And as we get older, the red bone marrow transitions to yellow bone marrow. It's got lots more fat, lots more adipocytes, but there are certain signaling cues that can convert that yellow bone marrow back to red bone marrow if necessary. So that's, that's pretty cool. Okay, yeah, that, that is really cool. Thank you. Rishi has a question. She noticed that we jumped straight into week two at the start of the presentation. So what happens in week one? Um, so I skipped to week two because did they go over week one, like fertilization and implantation a few weeks ago? Okay. Yeah. So that's the only reason why I jumped to week two. Yeah. Yeah, and our topic's gastrulation, and that occurs uh starting at around two weeks, um, two, two to three weeks after development is when it'll start. Um, so that's a good question because that week still is important right before then. And uh, so if you'd like to review any of those things, you can go to our YouTube channel, um, which can be accessed by going to the tutoring tab on the anatomy website. Did anyone else have any questions for um, Marquise or again, any questions about his path as a, a medical student too are, are on the table. Yeah, Michael has little, another um, question. I, I actually had a really weird, it's probably not uh, not really re very related, but for, for those like the gonadal stem cells, um, each time a cell divides, it has like, you know, the, the DNA is getting copied and it, it makes mistakes sometimes. Um, right. So over time, it, it degrades for most cells. But but when you have for those gonadal stem cells, how come the DNA doesn't degrade? Like, how come your uh, your sexual cells don't degrade in quality over time as you get an older person? Um, as far as, yeah, the DNA quality. So they actually do. So. I know um, in males, at least since um, spermatogenesis is always occurring um, and it's occurring like a lot. And so once you get older, um, the cells start becoming really weird and then some chromosomes are being left out and then some aren't getting degraded, like you were saying. And so a lot of chromosomal anomalies can occur and do occur. Uh, why doesn't that transfer to the next generation? um like the the next embryo that it makes so it can so um so if an older person who's like say an old i'll try to give like a little analogy or something so say like an older person who's like 60 70 who's been undergoing spermatogenesis really a lot like has a child with someone um, it is a higher chance that the child will have some sort of like chromosomal anomaly because of um, spermatogenesis occurring for 60, 70 years. And since it's occurring for so long, um, mess ups are bound to happen. So I guess to answer your question, yes, they can. Anomalies can occur and go to the next generation. And, and what, and, and that, that was an excellent answer, Marquise, actually. And I'm really proud of you because um, just coming up with that on the fly, that's a lot. And the other thing I'm sure Marquise, now that he's thinking about it even more, Michael, is that about 
we estimate that approximately 50% of all fertilization events, like we talked about, that happen um, beginning at the beginning of week one, that those either never make it to the endometrial lining for implantation and or 50% of those implant, but the amount of DNA mistakes or miscopies are so extensive or so horrendous that, that they just are not viable. And so they become spontaneously aborted. So again, a weird question, but a good one. Does that, yeah, sorry. One more follow-up to that is, does that, uh, does uh, your sperm DNA degradation transfer to your children's as far as their quality of sperm? Like, is that also lower quality or is it renewed somehow? No. So that's part of that reprogramming and sequestration that happens in the developing embryo that Marquise talked about, where the very first cells that migrate through that primitive streak and then sort of lock themselves away in the back wall of the yolk sac for a couple of weeks, there that what is happening is a reprogramming of all of the sort of methylation events, the epigenetics that were on the sperm and with the egg of the two parents. So in that fertilized, now developing embryo, sequestration is really key in the back wall of the yolk sac because all of that, it's almost like a reset button. All of it gets relayed, re erased so that it's kind of like a blank slate. And then as soon as that happens and you, you're moving as a growing cluster of cells towards the gonadal ridges in week five of the embryo, you're exposed to now nutrients and your surrounding extracellular fluid and the epigenetic programming clock starts all over again at about week five of the embryo. So again, pretty cool story. So Rishi is asking just for fun, I was wondering why humans have different blood types. Me? <laughs> um, so from what anyone can take this, I'm not a fan of blood typing, but from um, I know um, with blood typing, um, individuals have different antigens. And then like these different antigens, like the A antigen, B antigen, um, they can stimulate like immune responses to different um, bloods. And so that's my like small understanding of blood typing. I know that was poor. So if anyone can double up and help out. One thing I'll just point out um, about that question. I like that question. It's getting at, you know, kind of why do we have variation? Um, and I think that that's just something to point out is that's, you know, we notice that there's a lot of variation, not just with blood types, but with a lot of other things that we have as well. And, um, you know, just thinking offhand if something were to happen that, you know, if there's any diseases or anything, or, um, you know, maybe something that might make um, someone more susceptible to certain things, um, you know, it'd be good to have some variation in our population. So in terms of the why, I think, um, you know, I can't really exactly say why that we have those, but uh, just in general, I think having variation is a good thing for us to have. And maybe I'll just add, because I think Marquise was was starting to go down this road, is that those, the, what we call blood types, are proteins that kind of stick out from the surface of the red blood cell itself, and they have different protein shapes. And so that led to the different characterization, again, not creative on the part of scientists, but just a blood type A means you have a protein shape A on the surface of your red blood cells. If you have blood type B, the protein has a slightly different shape. If you have blood type O, then you don't have any of those proteins that are sticking out from the surface of your red blood cell. So again, it's kind of interesting. It all comes back kind of to DNA and genes, parents, what, what genes did you get for your blood type from your mom? versus your dad, and that kind of establishes then 
the protein markers you'll have on your red blood cells. Okay, so Marquise, uh, could you go back to the slide with the ecto endo nerves? And you said the nerves? Yeah, where it says ectoderm, endoderm, uh, mesoderm. And Michael, what is your question? Oh, it was it was just one of the one of the first slides. I just didn't get to write down all the information. I, yeah, yeah, that's the slide. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And this also is going to be it's recorded and it'll be on YouTube, so you don't have to like try to write down everything as fast as you can. I know that's really hard. Okay, are there any other questions for Marquise? If there are none, Marquise, excellent job, as with our other presenters. And I think um, since we've gotten through all the hard stuff, uh, what I would like to do is open up the floor for just general questions for our medical students. Uh, if you have any burning questions on their path to medical school or how they're doing in medical school or anything regarding medical school, please uh, just open your mic and, and uh, ask away. I, I actually had a question for Marquise. Um, with that uh, amniotic fluid, is that just filled with nutrients? Like it, it fills the amniotic cavity. Is that just filled with uh, nutrients for the embryo, developing embryo kind of thing? Um, I don't think it's nutrients. It's like some like protein, pro like proteinaceous fluid that the embryo, developing embryo just like floats in. Mason? And then oh. I have a question. Um, someone said, why can't type O give to other blood types, but can give to others? So do you, Marquise, do you want one of us to answer that? Is that, is, is that because it's in the chat was, I missed it, that you're asking about blood types and how they relate to blood donation. Is that what you're yes, asking one of us to, to answer? So really quickly, and again, not really related to anything we'll test you on, but I know you all are just interested and it is, it's interesting. So blood type O is considered to be the universal donor, which is because it has none of those surface marking proteins on the surface of the red blood cell. So if, I, if I'm blood type O, which actually I am, my blood can be given to any other individual because their immune system will not see any kind of surface markers on the surface of those donated red blood cells. Now, type AB is considered to be the universal recipient. And the reason is because they have both type A proteins, and let's just make this the shape of type B, and type B proteins on the surface of theirs. So their immune system is used to seeing those on their red blood cells. So they can get type A, they can get type B, or they can get type zero or O, because again, O has no surface proteins on the surface of those red blood cells. So type AB is considered the universal recipient and type blood or blood type O is considered, blah, considered the universal donor. So I hope that makes sense. Macy, what is your question? Uh, we can't hear you. Macy, for some reason, we're not picking up your voice. Could you just type it in the chat, please?
No problem. You, while I'm waiting for Macy, uh, Emily uh, is asking, do any of you know what a pre-med program is like? I'm considering it, but I don't know much about it. <coughs> do any of you know what a pre Okay. I think it was just printed a bunch of times here. Wow. Okay. So do any of you know what a pre-med program is like? I'm considering. So... Any of our panelists, would you like to chime in? I did not do a pre-med program. I did nursing into medicine, which is like a little different of a path. So I don't know that I'm super helpful with this question. I can try to answer it. So I guess like, since I was like a microbiology major, I was on like a pre-med path. So I don't necessarily know if that's like a pre-med program. But from my understanding, pre-med just basically means that you're taking the prerequisites to go to a medical, like to apply to medical school. And so that will consist of like your biology, like organic chemistry, your general chemistry, physics, and of course your um, your um, general studies. So, and what it's like, I feel like it's different each and every institution that you go to. So. Um, it's just really important to like do your research on like the school and the institution that you want to go to to kind of gauge how it's going to be. Okay. Kaylee is asking, I have a question. What general undergraduate majors would any of you recommend for medical school? I will answer this again because I actually love this question. Do you whatever major that you like want to do? Like if I can go back again, I would be like a writing or an English major. Because like I liked writing, but when I was going in, I was under the impression that you had to do like something science. And like that's not the case. Like I have friends that are like economics majors, like music majors. So do whatever major that you find interesting. And then you can just do the prerequisites on the side. I completely agree with that. I uh, My undergraduate program was pre-med. Um, I thought I wanted to go to medical school and I found anatomy and fell in love with it and ended up going to get my PhD instead. But um, I'm the classic biology major, undergraduate pre-med student. And I think that I don't, um, I don't think I really uh, uh, got much out of the biology part of it. It was more of just, I felt like I was supposed to be doing that, like Marquis said. And I completely agree that if I could do it all over again, I'd probably pick something else um, that I was more interested in over biology, but then still doing all of the, the you know, requirements that you need for that pre-med track, um, because then I could have just gotten a little bit more of a diversified education, not strictly just in the biological sciences. Okay, well, I think this last question is very uh, apropos. Uh, I was wondering what preferred study methods uh, are to retain large amounts of information, such as the things we learned tonight. So, presenters, <laughs> what that, words of wisdom can you give? That is the question. <laughs> that is the golden <laughs> ticket. Um, there are a ton of different study methods to use. Um, I am a very conceptual person when I learn things. So, for me, um, what studying looks like is often watching a lecture, going back through the notes and drawing things out on my whiteboard, and then creating my own flashcards to like look through. Um, I think everybody studies a little differently. Um, I know there's some really great like recall strategies and things that you can look up on YouTube. Those were never terribly helpful for me, but they work really well for other people. Um, so I would say this is a great time to begin understanding how you learn. So I know some of my classmates um, have coloring books and they do lots of coloring because like that helps them remember things. Um, there's, yeah, it, now is a great time to start experimenting with how you learn best. Um, and I don't think that it's, there's not a one size fits all. I think in terms of what technique you employ, there is 
uh, multiple ways that you can get that done, but ultimately some way that you're engaging in recall so that you're reaffirming that pathway for knowledge. Um, so for some people, it's looking at uh, flashcards. For me, that wasn't something that really helped me. I didn't really have the attention span for that. Um, what I helped me was to practice teaching. Um, and I would just pretend like there's someone in front of me, but that's still recall. It's still me remembering what I learned and trying to explain it in a simpler way out loud. Um, basically anything that you can do to try to reinforce that pathway without something in front of you telling you what that is, uh, I think is the best way to really solidify that information. But do it in a way that, you know, fulfills you and makes you happy while you're doing it. So last question, Any? does anyone have any recommendations for summer medicine technology or science related programs? Um, I didn't do any like science or summer programs until medical school. So, <laughs> <laughs> And I'm just going to say there are lots of programs out there and the Anato B is partnering with many of them. So the, the regional winners of, you know, the four different regions across the United States, the first place and the second place winner will be offered scholarship stipends to attend a summer experience of their choice. The first place winner will get a $3,000 stipend and the second place winner gets a $1,500 stipend to attend, again, some science related summer experience uh, in the summer of 2024. That's why you're all here. That's why you wanna study and do really well, not just to learn this material, but because of what opportunities it might and what doors it might open for you. So we're all about that in the anatomy. Okay, well, we are at the top of the hour. And so I want to allow uh, Dr. Pascura, Dr. Peterson, any final thoughts? words of wisdom, um, I'll let you have the last word. I was just gonna say thank you for being here and just some housekeeping for the next session. Um, so again, we are hosting all these sessions on the second and fourth Sundays of each month. And so what that means is actually a three week break until our next one. So we are gonna be talking about all muscles uh, in three weeks from now. So November 12th, you can join us again and we'll be going over muscular uh, anatomy, histology and embryology. So there'll be some nice overlap between our topics in our next session. Uh, but I think what you're doing and the fact that you're here is great and keep asking all the wonderful questions that you're doing. Um, I think it's all great. Yeah, and we won't see you between now and Halloween, so have a spooky Halloween. <laughs> Take care, right. everyone. Thanks, everyone.